16 here, we talk about equilibrium. And when we talk about equilibrium, they do uh, involve a specific type of reaction. And that type of reaction is basically a reversible reaction where really it could go in two different directions. Uh, going from, again, reactants to products is our forward direction. And obviously at some point you will build up enough products that they will recombine and actually start going backwards and start making some more reactants. And that is what is referred to as going in sort of the reverse direction. As we talked about last time, when we do reach uh, chemical equilibrium, we're not talking about again, uh, having exact same amounts on both sides or anything like that. Uh, we really talking about sort of the rate of the reaction and we're talking about the rate of the forward reaction will equal the rate of the reverse reaction. So that is what is meant when it does reach chemical equilibrium. Uh, you're basically going back and forth at the exact same rate. And what that does is, as we talked about, sort of lock everybody into place in terms of their concentrations where there are at that point. Uh, if you're dealing with any type of gases, also would obviously lock in their pressures at that particular point. And they will be able to maintain sort of the pressure or concentrations they're at as long as you don't really do anything to sort of screw up the equilibrium, they will maintain that. There is a expression that um, you could write for an equilibrium reaction. That's what's known as the equilibrium constant. And it is capital K. And it really is uh, really the products divided by the reactants. And when we do write the equilibrium expression, uh, we also do take the coefficients into account. So again, if this was like A and B and C and D here, uh, we would write the K is equal to the concentration of C to its coefficient divided by our times the concentration of D to its coefficient divided by A to its coefficient and B to its coefficient. So this relationship will always give you a constant value for a particular reaction as long as you keep pretty much the temperature constant, you don't change the temperature. And as we also talked about, you can pretty much start with various amounts of reactions or products in different sort of experiments, as long as you keep, again, that temperature constant, the ratio of products to reactants will always uh, basically come up the same. Uh, also, when we do the little bracket, that means concentration. And again, that is usually molarity we're talking about here, which is moles per liter. Now, uh, it is just a number, typically the equilibrium constant, and it does give us some information. So as we talked about last time, if we end up with a large value of K, that means when we reach equilibrium, we would mainly expect to have products there. Again, a large number on top here divided by a small number will give us a large number. And if we end up with a small value of K, the opposite would be true. We would end up expecting to have mainly reactants there at equilibrium. Again, uh, if you had a sort of a larger value on the bottom there, uh, that's going to give you a smaller value for K. Uh, big or small value one is sort of the uh, number that we use to determine that. Uh, anything considered kind of over one is considered a large value. Anything less than one is considered a small value. And as we talked about as well, I think, uh, there's various degrees of large and small. There's ones that are really, really large and there's ones that are very, very small. Any questions on any of that stuff there that we talked about? Obviously, if you are going to go into the equilibrium expression here, uh, you do need to make sure that all these guys are equilibrium concentrations in order to go into there. They cannot be initial concentrations. So you gotta make sure that they are the uh, equilibrium concentration. Okay, so I think we finished up last time on an example. Uh, we also sort of talked about some different types of equilibrium. Uh, homogeneous equilibrium is a, when everybody's basically in the same phase. So much like a homogeneous mixture where everything looks the same throughout. Uh, this means that all the reactants and all the products are basically the same phase. So as we see in the top one here, they are all gases. And the bottom one here, they are all aqueous uh, in a solution. Again, for each of these, we could write the equilibrium expression 
it would be the concentration of NH3 in this case squared divided by the concentration of N2 times the concentration of H2. And we would want to cube it there again. All those exponents come from the coefficients. Uh, if we wrote it for the bottom guy there, we could write our K is equal to the concentration of H plus times the concentration of CN minus divided by the concentration of HCN. For the most part, if you do it in concentration, sometimes they're more specifically called KC values. And KC values, again, just means concentration, basically. Uh, for something like the top one, which I think we might have touched upon as well, uh, you could write another equilibrium expression uh, that's sometimes referred to as a KP value, P meaning pressure. So instead of concentrations, we would take the pressure squared of NH3 divided by the pressure of N2 times the pressure cubed of H2. So obviously, if you're dealing with gases, you may not necessarily be dealing with concentrations. So sometimes you may be dealing with pressures. So you could write a similar sort of expression uh, if you know the equilibrium pressures at that point. They obviously would need to be equilibrium pressures uh, for you to put it into that sort of expression. Any questions on any of that there? <clears throat> Once again, for the most part, uh, if you sort of calculate the KP and the KC value, they usually don't equal each other, but they do equal each other in terms of numerical value, uh, but they do tell you the same thing. So if you have a large KP, same thing, you should have mainly products. If you have a small KP value, you have mainly reactants. As you'll learn, if you do take uh, 1B, there's like, uh, you know, a whole alphabet of letters that go with the cave stuff. And they're really all, it's still the same thing. They're all just uh, an equilibrium constant. Uh, they sort of focus on different things. <clears throat> all right. Now, heterogeneous equilibrium is when we do have uh, everybody sort of in some different phases. So everybody's not in the exact same phase. So on the first one here, a little decomposition reaction, we have our solids and we have our gases here on our liquid as well for our water into our gases. So as we talked about before, you know, there really are kind of two things that you do not include in the equilibrium expression. That's the two things we see here. One is a, anything that is a solid or anything that is a pure liquid. And the reason, again, these things are not included in the equilibrium is anything that is a solid is essentially just kind of sitting there. It's really not participating in anything. And anything that is a liquid, its concentration will remain constant. That means, as we talked about, aqueous and gas are the two things that you do include if you do write an expression here. So if we were to write the expression here for the top one, it would be the K would equal the concentration of O2 and it would be cubed. And that would be all that we would put in there because this guy is a solid, so it would not be included. And this guy is also a solid, so it would not be included in this expression. And that would be the only thing that would be there. If we did it for the bottom one, it would be our K is equal to the concentration of H2 squared times O2. And once again, since that is a pure liquid, we would not include it into our expression in this particular case. Really, if you think about why these two things are included in the equilibrium expression is for a very simple reason. Aqueous guys are typically ions, which means they're floating around and obviously participating with each other. And obviously, if you have gases, they are flying around, which means they're going to really participate uh, with each other and affect the equilibrium that's happening. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> Now, the position of a heterogeneous equilibrium, as I mentioned, doesn't depend on those solids or, bless you, are those liquids. And again, there's our equilibrium expression. We still do need to make sure we take into account, as we saw there, the actual coefficient. All right, so why don't you write the expression for this one right here, a little calcium fluoride, making some calcium ions and some fluoride ions. So right. Once again, our equilibrium expression, which is really our products 
divided by our reactants. And in this case, we would take the concentration of calcium times the concentration of fluoride. And once again, because of the two there, we will square it uh, up there on top. In terms of our reactant side, it is a solid. So that would be it then in this case. So it would just be these guys here. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> So in this case, obviously, we had just products that were happening here. Now, if you had something where perhaps, you know, maybe you had, you know, thanks. some equation like this where you went from gas and then on the other side, you know, maybe you made some solid, some liquid, something like that. You would write the equilibrium expression like this because none of these guys would be included because they're solid and liquids. You would actually just do one over the reactants in this case. So if you ever had a situation like that where nothing on the product side should be included, but something on the reactant side should be included, you just do one over the reactants and that would be how you would get the correct expression. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> Now, if a change is imposed on a system that's a equilibrium, uh, the position of the equilibrium will definitely change. And this is basically Le Chatelier's principle, which we did some work last experiment on that. So as I mentioned last time uh, during lab, this is really a situation where you basically have a system that has reached equilibrium. And basically what you do to it is you add some type of stress to it, as we talked about. And adding a stress could be something to do with the concentration. It could do something with the pressure or volume. It could be something with temperature. So these are common stresses that you could do, maybe a catalyst, Not too much of a stress, but it could be a catalyst. And what ends up happening is uh, you add a stress to the system and it pretty much messes up the equilibrium. So you have this nice system going back and forth at the same rate, you do something to it and then it basically screws it up. And what happens is the system will once again want to get back to equilibrium. So basically there's three things that could happen. It could shift to the right to once again get back to equilibrium, uh, which basically means we're gonna kind of make more products to help us get there. We could shift to the left, which basically means we would make more reactants to get us there. And in some cases, even though you sort of did some type of stress to the system, there's just gonna be no changes going to occur. So in some situations, even though you might've done something to it, it will really result in really no change will occur in that case. And what happens is once again, that reaction can get back to equilibrium. So as some of you as saw in the experiment, obviously, you know, you added something to your test tubes and the color shifted one way or the other, right? Uh, so maybe it had to make more products, so it got more red. Uh, or maybe it got more yellow as it needed to make more reactants. So as a result of you adding something to it, uh, it may have had to shift one way or the other. So we're gonna look at each of these stresses sort of individually here and talk about what happens when we sort of apply it to a system at equilibrium. So the first thing we're gonna look at is what we dealt with really in that lab, which was concentration. And basically, obviously there are two things you could do to it. You could add more. And when we add more, it does shift away from the side we added it to. So kind of add away, AA, it's a good way to remember that. Uh, the other thing we could do is remove. And when we remove, it will shift towards the side. 
you removed it from. So again, when we talk about sort of uh, which side are we removing it from, we're really referring to the balanced equation and you know what things are on our reactant side and what things are on our product side. So obviously, if we added more reactants, it would shift towards the products. Add more products, it would shift towards reactants. And obviously, vice versa, they're very removed along the way. As you saw in that experiment, uh, you know, a very easy way to add is just simply pick up a reagent that is, uh, has whatever is in the reaction there. So for example, I think maybe it has some iron three nitrate and you added that, that was really a source of iron three being added to it. Uh, you added some HCl along the way, I think to one of them as well. And that's a source of H plus and Cl minus. So adding is pretty simple. You just kind of pick up a reagent and just dump it into your beaker or your test tube, whatever it may be. Removing, um, again, in an aqueous sort of situation, usually revolves or involves you adding something that will make one of two things. It will either make a precipitate which means you just made a solid, which means that thing will no longer be part of the equilibrium. So that's like reaching in there and pulling it out. Or it will make some type of liquid like you did in a couple of those there where you added perhaps some acid or base to one of your test tubes and you basically make something like water, which is like removing H plus or OH minus in that particular equation. So again, because solids and liquids are not part of the equilibrium, by adding something that's not in the equation you're looking at, but that can react with something that's there, that is obviously a way that you can remove something, obviously in a solution situation. You can't just reach in, obviously, and grab out the ions or anything like that. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> so if we look at this here, just to demonstrate a little bit here, you know, if we had like a little teeter totter type thing here, fine quality stick figures. It's advanced stick figures, they got faces. All right. So if this is our system at equilibrium here, and so we'll call this guy the reactant side, this guy the product side. So in this particular case, if we decided somebody is going to hop on over here on the product side, uh, what is going to happen, right, is essentially this deal. And obviously we have just screwed up the equilibrium, right? So to fix that, we would need more people on the left or more people on the right. Probably need it to shift away from the side we added it, right? Put more people over there on the left-hand side. And once again, the system will be able to come back to equilibrium position here. This one. Now, if we have sort of the same situation here, reactants and products. And we're again, we're at equilibrium here. This guy decides, hey, I'm just gonna hop off there on the right-hand side. When he hops off on the right-hand side, we're gonna get this situation that's going to occur. And now clearly to fix this situation, we need to throw some more people to the right-hand side where we removed. So again, it shifts towards the side we removed it from. That's going to allow this guy to get back into an equilibrium position where everybody is happy here. Any questions on that? Clearly the take home message is do not sit on the left-hand side, right? Just not a good side to sit on. So if we had something, say, like uh, and if I added more B, if I removed 
C added uh, A removed B. Will it shift to the right, left, or will there be no change? So take a moment and decide in this case. Be on the reactant side, so when we add it shifts away, so it is going to shift to the right. The reason for that, again, is we just added pretty much more reactants, which is going to kick off the forward direction of that reaction and start to make more products. Uh, if we remove C over here, if we remove C, it's on the product side, which means it also should shift towards the side we removed it from. And you can think about it, if we kind of remove C, it kind of creates a hole on the right side. So it's also going to basically kick off the forward reaction to sort of fill it back up because we have less products, obviously, at that point. If we added more A, it would shift to the right. Again, more A would kick off that forward reaction occurring. And lastly, here, if we remove B, B being, again, on our reactant side, Again, you can think of it like a hole. So we kind of made a little hole there on the reactant side, got to kind of fill it up. So it's going to shift to the left in that case towards it. Any questions on any of that there? <clears throat> okay, so that's concentration, which obviously you had some experience with there on that last lab. Uh, the next only thing we're going to talk about in terms of stresses is pressure and volume. And really, these guys are sort of tied to each other, and they're tied to each other by our good friend Boyle, right? He had a law, one of those things. And that is, as the pressure goes up, what happens to the volume? It goes down, right? So that opposite relationship, and obviously vice versa, pressure goes down, volume goes up. So when we're dealing with pressure and volume, they are oftentimes tied to each other, and usually it involves gases is what we're looking at here in this equilibrium. So if we sort of raise the pressure because the volume decreased, what's going to happen in this case is basically the pressure went up. So we kind of want to bring it back down. So if we have a much smaller volume, we want to shift to the side. Shift to the side with the least number of gas molecules. And again, the reason for that is if we got this really small volume, we want kind of less gas molecules in there because in that smaller volume with the less gas molecules, less collisions going to bring the pressure back down. So it went up, so we kind of want to bring it back down. Um, and again, less gas molecules is going to achieve that. Opposite is true here. If we see a decrease in the pressure, and that's usually a result of the volume increasing, what we want to do is shift to the side with the most gas molecules. And for that reason is if we have sort of a larger volume, if we put more gas molecules in there, what's going to happen is we're going to increase the rates of collision. And since the pressure went down, that will bring the pressure back up and sort of fix the problem that occurred there. Now, is that to the left? Is that to the right? It really does depend on the equation. So you have to look at the equation. You have to look at everybody in the equation that's got a G next to it and basically just add up the coefficients. Yeah, so, you know, if we had an equation like this where we had 2A plus B, goes to 2C, that is two gas molecules and one gas molecule would give me three gas molecules on the left. Coefficient there is two would be two gas molecules on the right. So obviously it's reaction dependent. You just got to kind of add up those guys and really just the coefficients is all you got to add up on each side for everybody that has a G associated with it. <clears throat> Question on pressure and gases here. The next stress that uh, you could do to a situation is actually temperature. So you could sort of change the temperature and that could have an effect on the equilibrium. And if we do that, let's take a look at what happens with temperature here. So the nice thing about temperature is it works the same way as concentration.
which means if we increase the temperature, it should shift away. And if we decrease the temperature, it should shift towards it. So the question is, how do I know which side temperature is on? And it has to do with what type of reaction you're dealing with. Is it an exothermic reaction? Or is it an endothermic reaction? So exothermic means heat and energy is released. And what we consider, maybe not correct in all aspects, but what we consider in that case is that heat or temperature is a product, like it's being given off, which means if you increase an exothermic reaction, it should shift to the left. If you decrease an exothermic reaction, it should go to the right. Endothermic is opposite, is being absorbed. So we think of heat as a reactant in this case. Like it's being absorbed. So it would be the opposite effect here. If the temperatures increased in an endothermic reaction, we would expect it to shift away and head towards the product side. And if it is decreased in an endothermic reaction, it should come towards the reactant side. What helps us determine that is a couple of energy terms we've seen before. Delta H is most commonly used here. And that's the enthalpy that we talked about. In an exothermic reaction, it is negative. Delta H here is a positive number in a endothermic reaction. So usually in these type of problems, a lot of times they'll just give you the equation and just simply give you the delta H value. And again, the value doesn't really matter whether it's positive or negative, it's important. Or they may tell you it's endothermic or exothermic. Or the last thing they'll do is actually in the equation, give you like an energy value written on one side or the other. And that is how you can determine that. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> One of the last things you could do that really will not actually have that much of a change to the equilibrium is you could actually add a catalyst to a system at equilibrium. You could even add a noble gas as well. Um, if you do add a catalyst, for example, a reminder that a catalyst is not a product, it's not a reactant, it is there just to make the reaction occur. Occur faster. It actually will have no change on a system at equilibrium. It'll just get there quicker. So that's one of the ways you could get a no change in a sort of Le Chatelier's principle question. The other way is with gases. If you have equal numbers of gases on both sides, there is no more or less gases. So. Uh, if you're doing something with pressure and volume, that's another way that you could get sort of a no change situation that occurs. Also, like I mentioned before, you could add a uh, noble gas or something like that, which is chemically inert, uh, which means it will not also affect uh, the equilibrium as well. So those are a few ways you could kind of get a no change uh, situation occur. Equal number of moles of gas on each side, uh, adding a catalyst or like adding a noble gas. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> Okay, so let's take a look here. Let's say we did have, uh, we'll go with uh, 3A. All right, so let's say we, and we'll go our delta H here is negative 125 kilojoules. Let's say we added more C. Let's say we decreased the volume. We removed A. We increased the temperature. We lowered the pressure. And that's good. So will it shift 
So C is a product, which means when we add, it should shift away. So it should shift to the left as that would increase the products and increase the reverse reaction happening. If we decrease the volume, that means we have a much smaller volume. So always in a small volume, we need less gas molecules. And looking on the equation here, that is five gas molecules on the left and four gas molecules there on the right which means in this case, they would actually shift to the right. If we removed A, A is a reactant, which again, kind of creates a hole on the reactive side. So to fill that, we got to go towards it and kind of fill up that hole there. Any question on those so far? <clears throat> Increasing the temperature, we will look at our delta H value. Frankly, we just look at that part. That tells us it is exothermic. And exothermic means that pretty much heat is a product. So heat is on the product side, which means that it will shift away from the product side and it will cause that reverse reaction to occur. Lastly here, we're decreasing the pressure, which means in terms of volume, we're increasing the volume which means we need more gas molecules to fill that up and counteract the dropping pressure. And in this case, that would cause it to shift to the left. Any questions on any of those there? Our Lachalier's principle. <clears throat> All right, so this is kind of what we talked about. Again, uh, adding will shift away and removing will go towards. And obviously our volume here uh, will be affected the pressure. Now, the one thing as I've talked about that will affect uh, the actual value though of K is the temperature. Uh, so, Increasing or decreasing temperature is dependent on exothermic or endothermic reactions. But remember that is also the one thing that will actually affect the value of it. So what, again, what I mean by that is if you calculated the equilibrium constant at 25 degrees for like four different experiments, they all should be the same value of K. If you change it to 45 degrees Celsius and calculate K for the same sort of four experiments, they will all equal the same value, but the K value for 25 degrees versus 45 degrees is a different value. Questions on that there. <clears throat> All right, so uh, consider this reaction. How many of the following would lead to a shift in the equilibrium to the right? So let's take a look and see. If we remove CO, CO is over here, that would cause it to shift. If we add some. One method for production of hydrogen is in this exo. So first off, it is endothermic. So if we add some more water, which in this case would cause the equilibrium to shift to the right and thus would actually be increasing the amount of H2. So that would not be good. By the way, here, water does affect it because water in this case is not a liquid, it is a gas. So water in its gas form will affect equilibrium. Water in its liquid form will not. So sometimes people are like, hey, it's water, it's not stuff to be included. Uh, but in the gas, it will affect it. The volume of the container is double. So that means the volume is increased. So we're going to go to the side with more gas molecules. Left-hand side there has two. Right-hand side has four. So we are going to shift to the right in this case, which once again will increase the amount of H2. So that's not going to work. CH4 is removed. So that is going to cause the equilibrium to shift to the left. 
which means we are going to need to use up some H2 to do that. And that should cause the H2 to start to decrease in that case. And the temperatures increase. So if we increase the temperature, that is like increasing reactance, which will cause the equilibrium to shift to the right. And that obviously would increase the amount of H2, not decrease it. So in this case, it looks like number three is your only one that will reduce the amount of H2 in this case. Any questions on any of those there? <clears throat> All right, so uh, we've talked about this a number of times. Again, the value of K uh, greater than one means that the reaction is going to go towards the product side, less than one gonna to go to the reactant side. And there are degrees of that where you can't get an equilibrium that's really, really large that even though it technically is a one-way, a uh, two-way street, it's all gonna kind of go to the product side. And obviously if you have a very small one, it will go to the reactant side. <clears throat> So we've talked about this, I think. All right. So why don't we try this one? At a given temperature, the equilibrium constant is 50 for this reaction. Calculate the equilibrium concentration of H2. If these guys are, we're going to assume the equilibrium concentrations of the other guys. So solve for the equilibrium concentration of H2 based on the other equilibrium concentrations. So we want to start with the equilibrium expression, which once again is our products, which in this case would be HI. We do need to square it because of the two that is there. We're going to divide it by the concentration of H2 and the concentration of I2. And that actually in this case will equal 50. Uh, in this case, uh, we are given everything but the H2. So we're gonna multiply the H2 to the other side and divide by the 50. And that would give us that the concentration of H2 would equal HI squared divided by 50 and divided by I2. Again, basically multiplying H2 to both sides and dividing by 50, right? Putting that in would give us that the H2 would equal our HI, which was given to us 5.0 times 10 to the minus one squared divided by 50 and divided by 1.5 times 10 to the minus two. And if we do all that good stuff there. Looks like a uh, 0 0.33 and you would need molarity here as it is a concentration questions on that there. So obviously, if you have the equilibrium concentrations given to you, you can calculate the equilibrium constant. And like in this example, if you know the value of the equilibrium constant and some of the equilibrium concentrations, you can figure out the missing concentration. All right. So we're gonna talk about uh, solubility equilibrium. I'm not sure why, but we're gonna talk about it. This is KSP. This is a special type of uh, equilibrium, which is known as KSP. That stands for the solubility product. And it is an equilibrium for things that are typically insoluble. So if you remember solubility rules, there's a whole bunch of stuff that's normally insoluble. And that is how uh, these guys are set up. The reactions are always set up this way. It is always the solid guy over here. And it's always ions, aqueous ions on this side, like positive and negative guys. Like for example, if you take silver chloride, which is insoluble, we'll make silver ion and chloride ion here. And this will set up an equilibrium in solution, and you could write what is known as the KSP for this by taking our silver ion times our chloride ion. Once again, we would not include this guy as it is a solid in this particular case, and pretty much all KSP expressions are that. They're always solid on the left-hand side there, so it's really just the products that are usually involved in these type of calculations. 
Now we can use this sort of equilibrium expression to help us understand uh, the solubility of something or what the concentration of the ions will be in solution. These values are typically very, very small values, KSP values, which means they are typically staying on the reactant side, which is why they are considered usually insoluble because on the reactant side, it is the solid that is there. So if we look at our expression here for our Bi2S3, again, this being a solid not included. So once again, just the product side here included. Again, Bi3 plus squared because of the coefficient, S2 minus uh, cubed because of the coefficient. Now, in a saturated solution of PbCl2 is prepared by dissolving a salt with some distilled water, we want to calculate the concentration of lead 2 at equilibrium. To do these type of problems, uh, we do what is referred to as an ice table. And ice table, the I stands for initial change and equilibrium, basically, is what these that stands for. And again, you won't see this again until like chem 1B, but uh, that is what I stands for there. Initial change in equilibrium. Maybe in 1A you'll see it. Sometimes people do it for limiting reagent problems and stuff like that. So to start this, what we would do is actually just start with the reaction. So in this case, it would be PBCL2, which based on solubility rules is going to be a solid. It would break apart though into lead ion and two chloride ions. Now, even though things are technically insoluble, everything has some degree of solubility. So technically we look at this and go, it is going to be a solid. There is still a little bit of the ions that are in that solution, usually a very small amount. We could write our KSP expression for this, which again is the concentration of PB times the concentration of Cl and we would square it. And it actually equals 1.6 times 10 to the minus two. So to start our ice table here, we would start initially, because this guy is a solid, I'm not gonna write anything on that side because it's not involved. We could assume that initially we have nothing of either of these guys. The C, which is the change part, is usually represented by a letter. And in this case, usually an S, but we'll use X as a nice letter. So X usually represents the change. Now, if this reaction is gonna to go towards the product side, which is what we would assume to happen here since we have no products to begin with, should I have more or less reactants? I should end up having less reactants and I should be making more products. So typically what we would do is go to our, this side and normally go minus X, but we're not gonna do that because this is a solid. But this side would then be plus X and this side would be plus two X. Now the two comes from the coefficient because that takes care of everybody's favorite stuff, the stoichiometry, the mole to mole relationship. So it's really important when you do the change part that you take the coefficient into account. So this guy's a one, which is why this is one X. And this is a two, which is again, why that is two X. So it's really important to take that into account. It takes care of the stoichiometry for you. When we do this at equilibrium, we will have X of this guy and 2x of that guy right there. Any questions on that so far? The goal of doing an ice table like this is to basically figure out what x is and allow us to do that. We're going to then take our equilibrium line and we're going to take both of these values and put it into our KSP expression. So we're going to put those guys in there and we're going to solve for x. So I'm just gonna flip page there so I could have something to write on, I think. So in this case, we have the KSP was our lead two times our chloride. And again, that equaled 1.6 to the minus two. Putting in our value from the equilibrium line would give us X times two X, and that would need to be squared is equal to 1.6 times 10 to the minus two. And again, I'm just taking my equilibrium line here and putting that into my expression. 
at this point, it's now just math. This will give me something like 4x cubed, yes. You want to make sure that you square the number. Most people forget to square the number. They just do the x and not the number. Equals 1.6 times 10 to the minus 2. I'm going to divide both sides by 4. Going to give me 1.6 that 1.6 minus 2 divided by 4. 4 times 10 to the minus 3. I'm going to take the cube root of both sides. And that would get me something like uh, 0 0.159 as my x value. Um, by the way, cube root, if you don't have a button on your calculator, you could basically take uh, like the carrot to this guy, one divided by three. We'll do that. So take the number to the carrot, one divided by three. We'll do the cube root for you as well. At this point, uh, what does this X represent? This X represents what is in the table so for us, that would mean that our lead concentration at equilibrium equals X. So the concentration of lead at equilibrium equals X, which means it equals 0 0.159 molar. If I wanted the concentration of Cl minus at equilibrium, I could go back to my table and I see that at equilibrium it is equal to two times X. So we would take two times X, which would give us two times 0 0.159. And that would get us 0 0.318 molar for our chloride. <clears throat> Question on that there. How can I check if I didn't screw up? Well, these are now the equilibrium concentrations, right, of both of these numbers, which means if I put them back into this expression, it should equal this number. So if you do that and you put it back in, you get approximately 1.6 times 10 to the minus 2, which is obviously the exact same number, maybe slightly off with rounding, but it should obviously equal that equilibrium constant. Question on any of those steps there. So typically in an ice table, you are sometimes given a starting amount on this side. So you would put it there if it obviously wasn't a solid, but you could usually a lot of times just assume that you're starting with nothing on the product side there to begin with. So why don't you give this one a try? Calculate the solubility of silver chloride if the KSP is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 10, silver chloride being this guy. To see what you come up with. KSP expression here, once again, in this case, it will just be our products as our reactant is a solid. And once again, this would equal 1.6 times 10 to the minus 10. We'll do our ice table. We will start with zeros on the product side. Once again, we're gonna ignore this guy since he's a solid. Our change would be plus X in this case and plus X as each coefficient is one. That means at equilibrium, we would have X and X. And questions on the table there. Once again, the goal here is to solve for X. So we're going to put that into our KSP expression, which will basically give us X squared is equal to 1.6 times 10 to the minus 10. Square rooting both sides there will give us... an X value of 1.3 times 10 to the minus five, which if we go back to our table, that is equal to the concentration of silver. And it's also equal to the concentration of chloride. And it is a one to one relationship between those two, which means it is also the concentration of silver chloride 
at equilibrium as well, since everything is a one-to-one -one relationship. By the way, in these KSP problems, when you solve for X, that really is what's known as the molar solubility, that is solubility of the whole compound. Just for reference sake, if you take that guy, which is basically moles per liter of silver chloride, and you times it by the molar mass of silver chloride, uh, which is like 107.9 plus 3545, which is 143.4 grams per mole. That means you get a solubility of 0 0.002 grams per liter. That means that if you have silver chloride and one liter of water, you could dissolve a whopping 0 0.002 grams of it which means it is pretty much insoluble, which is why we think of silver chloride as being insoluble. That's basically a thousand milliliters, yeah. <clears throat> Any questions on that calculation there? Okay, one last one here. I'm gonna run through it with you to show you what to do when you actually do have something on the left-hand side there. So let's say we have this reaction here, H2 plus I2 goes to 2HI and the equilibrium constant is 54 and we're going to start with initial concentrations of 0.5 so in this case we would do our ice table and we would also do our equilibrium expression which is hi squared i think we saw this one on an earlier example h2 and i2 and that would equal 54 now, in this case, unlike the other ones, we actually do have initial concentrations. So on the initial line, we would go with 0.5 on each of those guys. Again, they are gases, so they're included. And we would still go with zero over there on our product side. So that's a little bit of the difference there. The change part of the table will be exactly the same. We're going to do minus X in this case, because these guys are participating. So we should be losing a reactant. So that's why they're negative. And on the product side, we would have two X here, again, because of the coefficient. That means when we get down to equilibrium here, we end up with 0 0.5 minus X, 0 0.5 minus X and two X. Any questions on the ice table there? So it's very similar, except in this case, we actually do have initial concentrations there on the left. And because they are participating the left-hand side there again would be minus because they should be decreasing with time as we're starting with no products. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> just like we did before, we just got a few more things involved here. We're going to take our equilibrium line and we're going to put it into our equilibrium expression. And that would get us, not that, it would get us 2x on top squared times 0 0.5 minus x times 0 0.5 minus x on the bottom. And that would equal 54 in this particular case. This case, we do want to solve for x and we don't want to do a lot of work. So we're just going to put a very giant square root on both sides since it is actually a perfect square on both sides. And if you do that on the left-hand side, you will end up with just two X up on top. And obviously you'll end up with just one of these guys on the bottom, which would be 0 0.5 minus X. And the thing that you wanna to remember to do, which I always forget personally, is to actually take the square root of 54. And that would get you 7.348. Any questions on that there? Now we do have a little bit of math to do. We need to multiply what's on the bottom all the way over to the other side. And that's going to give us two X is equal to 7.3 times 0.5, which gives you 3.674 minus 7.348 X. Again, multiplying everything on the bottom of the other side. We want to combine our X's, which means we're going to add this back to the other side. And when we do that, that gives us something like 9.348 X is equal to 3.674. Lastly, we're going to divide both sides by the nine. And that would get us 9.348. Gets us an X value of 0 0.393. 
any questions on any of those steps there. <clears throat> that in this case is not our answer, right? That is just the value of X in each of these equilibrium parts. So to find our concentration of H2, which would equal our concentration of I2, it is 0 0.5 minus our X, which is 0.393. That gives us for those two guys, 0 0.107 molar. And for HI, it is two times X. And for HI, that would then give us 0.786. And those would represent our equilibrium concentrations uh, for each of these guys at equilibrium. So I just wanted to show you this one because I think maybe on one of the, uh, the problems there on the lab, I think you have some initial concentrations on one of them. So again, it just kind of works the same way. This is obviously actually a simple way to solve this. More complicated way when you get into Chem 1B would be like using the quadratic formula and stuff like that, which nobody wants to do or those things. All right, any questions on ice tables or anything like that? All right, well, congratulations. That wraps up Chem 3 for the season. Yeah.